the ISS is much more than a simple home in orbit around the Earth. Above all, it's a top-flight science laboratory in permanent residence in space. Over the past two decades, astronauts have carried out over 1,700 experiments there. Japan, the U.S., and Europe have each supplied a lab. Kibo, Destiny, and Columbus. The almost total lack of gravity and the almost total vacuum outside the station makes for an environment that is impossible to recreate on Earth. These two properties create ideal research conditions and the chance to use some unique chemical and physical processes. This research can be absolutely fundamental. With essential questions involving the effects of gravity on metabolic modifications, on combustion, on alloys, on fluid mechanics, with issues we can't explore on Earth because we cannot remove the effects of gravity. The research carried out in this permanent space lab covers multiple fields like biology, material science, observation of the Earth, and astronomy. The results of some experiments already carried out have allowed us to create revolutionary new alloys and new medical treatments. The ISS also means we have a permanent human presence in space and can thus prepare for future manned voyages to other planets. Not only have certain experiments been useful for key research, but some will help us fly farther, higher and faster. The success of the veggie experiment, which involved growing lettuce in orbit, is considered a real advance in terms of long-term space missions. The system was designed to supply a permanent source of fresh food to the crew. On board the space station, they are also carrying out experiments in robotics. In a few years, remote-controlled robots could build other stations or even carry out experiments. This is another stepping stone towards Mars. But the special thing about this joystick was that I could feel the forces that the robot was exerting. And that's sort of a, a first step towards developing what we call an exoskeleton arm, which is a, a robotic arm that you can wear yourself. And as you move your arm, the robot follows your arm movements, but at the same time, it sends back the forces so you can actually feel and control the forces that the robot is exerting. In the future, humans will also need to be capable of withstanding very long voyages. As such, the human body is also subjected to experiments on the ISS. Tube's filling up quite nicely. We're guinea pigs up there, so we're doing, we're participating in experiments, studying the, uh, the effects on our bodies in that environment, uh, the weightlessness, uh, radiation, and any other aspects of that unique environment. The last 10 years have shown that the vision of 75% of astronauts is altered by long stays in space. For a long time, it was believed that the rush of blood to the head was behind these sight issues. But recently, it has been established that the liquid surrounding the brain and the spinal cord can also play a role in these vision problems. We're still not quite sure of the cause. Um, there are uh, some theories that it's intracranial pressure causing it. Maybe higher CO2 levels that we breathe in the atmosphere might contribute towards this as well. Um, but what seems to be happening is a, a flattening of the retina. Um, and, and that flattening of the retina is causing uh, up to about a diopter shift in vision, so becoming, becoming nearsighted. What this shows us is that in the end, human beings have an astonishing capacity to adapt. In a weightless environment, the astronauts' bodies lengthen and can grow between two to seven centimeters in length. And this is something I find as remarkable about our, our human body, is how good it is at adapting to new environments. Um, if we were going to live in space uh, in microgravity permanently, then the human body is, is brilliant. It would be offloaded, the heart muscle would shrink, our bone density would reduce, our muscle mass would reduce, and we would very quickly become a, a very good being, a very good uh, body for living in microgravity. After six months in orbit, it's only when they return to Earth that the astronauts truly realize the importance of gravity's pull on their bodies. 
Для меня было шоком и открытием, когда It was really shocking. After my first flight, I felt just how heavy my arms were. Я почувствовал, Really heavy. Я почувствовал I could also feel my guts. I really could. I, I don't know how to explain it to you, but I could feel the organs inside me. And I can tell you, they're really heavy. The idea of establishing a manned space station in orbit around the Earth is not a new one. In the 1920s, the Russian Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, the undisputed grandfather of astronautics, imagined a space station where men could live. In 1971, the Russians sent the first space station into orbit, named Salyut-1. The Americans responded two years later with Skylab. Then, in the middle of the Cold War, in 1975, the Russians and Americans proved that space cooperation was possible, with a joint Apollo-Soyuz mission. After Apollo-Soyuz, there was a pause in the manned spaceflight programs in both the USSR and the USA. In the mid-1980s, space cooperation was no longer. The Americans had the shuttle, and the Soviets were dominating manned spaceflight with the Mir station. The USA was planning to build its own station, but given the mammoth size of the task and the cost involved, the Europeans, Canadians, and Japanese came on board. With the collapse of the Soviet bloc, Russia was also invited to join the adventure, and the result was the ISS. Everyone involved committed to sharing their knowledge and supplying part of the station. The construction process was simple. 15 modules would be built on Earth and then assembled in space. In fact, the space station is the biggest plug and play that has ever been made. The scope of the project was immense. Today, we still talk about the pyramids with admiration. And the ISS is the same. In the future, we'll talk about the ISS like we talk about the pyramids. The space builders entered the frame in 1998, when the first American module was anchored to the first Russian one. Over the space of two years, more and more missions set off to build the station and prepare for the arrival of its first permanent residence. On November 2, 2000, cosmonaut Sergei Krikalev officially became the first resident of the International Space Station. The first thing we had to do was to turn the lights on. We had to establish the link with Earth, and I had to find a cable hidden behind a panel. And then we could do the first report. Yes, the first thing we had to do was turn the lights on. After that, we plugged in the service module systems. We started the unit for creating air, for purifying the carbon dioxide and ventilating with oxygen. They were critical moments. If we hadn't been able to get that going, we wouldn't have been able to stay on the station for long because the reserves in the Soyuz vessel were very low. Building the station took 115 launches to bring the modules and teams into space. Canada provided a key element in the shape of a robotic arm. 17 meters long, it is used to move modules, supplies, material, and even astronauts. The fruit of international cooperation the ISS gradually took shape in the sky. We designed every mission so that if something didn't work, we would put it back into the shuttle and we'd bring it back home, but we never had to do that. Everything worked up there and it was uh, amazing. Especially when you consider that many components of the space station never were tested together on the Earth and integrated only on paper. 
Of course, it was all theoretical. And I was pretty surprised to see that we got it fully deployed. It's an absolutely extraordinary example of technological prowess. The construction and operation of the International Space Station is the most expensive project ever undertaken by humankind, costing some $150 billion. Firstly, it's not a huge amount of money, and what we're getting in return is a vast amount of scientific knowledge and understanding that is benefiting people back here on Earth. And if nothing else, it's, a, it's an incredibly valuable insurance policy for the future. From Earth, you can now clearly see this giant construction set that shines so brightly in the sky. The reason it's so bright is because of the massive solar arrays. The surface area of the solar arrays provide such a great reflective surface uh, for a viewer on the surface of the Earth. And it's through those solar arrays that we capture the sun's energy, produce electricity, and charge batteries that are then discharged when we're, we're on the night side of the Earth. When fully deployed, each panel is 73 meters long. They are permanently angled to face the sun, and each one is comprised of more than 32,000 solar panels to capture energy from the sun. So the solar rays articulate. So as we orbit around the Earth at four degrees per minute, the solar rays articulate at four degrees per minute to, to continue to point to the sun. We also have, because of the orbit that we're in, we we have a change in what we call the beta angle, and that means the solar rays have to articulate in this degree of freedom as well. Um, and we have joints that do that, and the, the computers uh, track the sun and then control the solar rays accordingly. Together, the solar panels from the ISS could supply the electricity for around 40 houses. This unique energy source is of vital importance for the crew. There would have to be a catastrophic accident for the station to end up without power. But even if that did happen one day, we have independent batteries. And we also have solar batteries on our Soyuz vessels. It's virtually impossible to imagine the station without electricity. 